Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. Uh, first off, I'd like to address the elephant in the room. Uh, last week, I apologize for all the uh, technical difficulties that prevented us from doing our episode last week. It was kind of a, a fluke of things. Um, for all of you who have been with us, I definitely appreciate you being with us this entire time. But, you know, we're still learning. We're still adapting to a lot of this stuff. Um, so each time we try to make this a little bit better, um, we've got some new gear that should help with the streaming process in the future. Um, so hopefully each episode we do gets a little bit better. Um, so I appreciate everyone, um, hanging in and understanding next, uh, from last week's episode. I would like to mention that we're going to have Gil back on, uh, next month. I think the plan is to have him back, uh, for September. Uh, I'm sorry, October special guest. Um, so we're, we're going to try to get that all taken care of and, uh, try to make it the best that we can. So other than that, we're going to get started today. Uh, if you've never joined us before, welcome to the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. It takes place at 10 a.m. Uh, all these episodes are generally live, and they are recorded. So if you ever want to go back and take a look at any of the stuff we talked about, you can always go back to the YouTube channel here and re-watch any of the episodes uh, that you might have there. Now... If you haven't joined us before, thanks for being with us this morning. And for those of you who have, have, have been with us the whole time, thanks for hanging out and spending your Friday morning with us. We really appreciate it. Now, we cover everything from what's up into the nighttime sky like we're going to be doing today. We do equipment talks. We talk about you know helpful tips and tricks for imaging and observing. And then, of course, the last Friday of each month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. So we try to shake things up and have it the best it can be. But uh, thanks for being here, and thank you for spending Friday morning with us. Now, it's September, which means we got to see what's up for the month. And that's what we're doing today. Now, uh, if you like what you see here and you want to be kept up, uh, please hit subscribe and leave a like on any of the videos. Um, it does help us keep this channel going. It tells the higher ups we're doing a good job and it's worth doing. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Leave a like on the video. Um, it really does help. If there's any topics that you want us to cover, go ahead and email that to info at skywatcherusa.com. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. We are in need of some new ideas. We're getting ready for the next quarter of episodes as well as next year. So if there's an episode or a topic that maybe you want us to cover, send it over. We'll love to check it out. Uh, we actually really would like to check that out. Um, so yeah, go ahead and do that. If you need to email us, just email us at info at skywatchusa.com. Uh, if you want to get on our mailing list, we do email out all what's going on. You can go to our homepage there and hit the subscribe uh, button up at the top there. Um, it'll add you to the email list and it actually tells you what's going on um, each week as well because we do send an email blast out for these episodes. That's pretty much my pitch at the moment. So let's get right to it. The moon. The moon is the brightest thing in the nighttime sky. We're all very aware of that. Now, we kind of have to plan our evenings and dark sky outings around the moon. So let's start here. Uh, the new moon for the month is actually next week. September 7th is the new moon uh, for September. That means your dark sky weekend is actually going to be this weekend. And if you're here in the United States, it's Labor Day weekend, which means it's three days. So if you're heading out to a nice dark sky, you've got an extra night to go observing. It kind of works out really well. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, check it out and you know, definitely get out and start doing some observing. Hopefully you have a good uh, weekend ahead of you to you know, hopefully get out and do some dark sky observing. I have some ideas for you to check out if you're going out there and you want to image and such. So keep an eye out for that here in a second. We're going to go over some cool objects that are up for the month. Now, of course, new moon is the weekend we all wait for, but we also have to worry about full moon. 
full moon is September 20th. That will be the brightest, of course, night of the uh, of the month. But on September 20th, it's actually probably the most well-known full moon of the entire year. That's because it's the harvest moon. Now the harvest moon, of course, gets its name because it provides the illumination for farmers to for the harvest that takes place in autumn, at least for the northern hemisphere. So, of course, that's where it gets its name. That's going to be on September 20th. So plan your outings accordingly. Uh, if you want to get some deep sky targets, maybe you want to do some Milky Way photography. Milky Way is still in a very good position right now, uh, right after dark. So this will be a fantastic weekend to get out and do that um, while it's still up and well positioned. Because as we start to move into October, that window is going to start going away as we see the rise of the autumn and winter objects uh, and constellations as we move forward through the month. So if you're looking to get out, this will be the weekend to do it. Got three days if you're here in the U.S. for a three-day weekend. And the full moon will be on the 20th, so plan accordingly. Now, we also have some of our good friends, the planets are up as well. Now, we finally have a collection of them. Of course, we have Venus. Venus is a very bright object in the western sky. If you're into astronomy and your friends know it, you've probably gotten a call asking what the heck is in the, uh, the western sky after sunset. Is it a plane? Is it a UFO? No, it's the planet Venus. Um, I'm going to pull up our rusty uh, Stellarium. Uh, if you've never played with Stellarium before, it's a free app. You can get it online. It works great if you're... Uh, let me pull up some of my stuff here. Uh, it's free. It works really well. Uh, if you are if you want something to walk in the way. It's a great planetarium app. So there we go. Um it doesn't cost anything. It does a very nice job as well. So anyway, here is our night sky around uh, 8 o'clock. So, and this is for night, actually. Oh, this, why is this on 2020? We don't ever want to go back to that year. Sorry about that. Boop, there we go. No more moon. That's no moon. Um, so... All right, sorry about that. I was off of why the moon was even up. So looking west just after sunset, let me back this up a little bit. Uh, I've got the sun setting. Mercury is still down in the muck. It's You're not going to get it. You can observe Mercury during the day if you want. There's not much to it, but that's the only way to do it. We're not talking about Mercury anyway because it's not in an ideal position. Venus, on the other hand, right there, big, bright, easy to see right after sunset. Um, Nice and high, actually, uh, to observe. So if you want to get out and image uh, Venus right now, that would be the time to do it. It is a gibbous uh, phase right now. So it's I like observing it when it's in the crescents. I think it's more dramatic, but um, it, you can still get a cool view. It's something to show your friends and family or if you're back doing outreach events, good for you. Um, it's a fun target to show people because, you know, it's a planet. But Venus is visible right after sunset. Uh, usually right around 8 o'clock, it's going to be pretty much gone uh, for the evening. So you've got a, an hour or two, depending on when you get out and start observing it. If you look carefully, you can see it right as the sun hits the horizon. Um, it is easy to see if you know what you're looking for. Now, as we pass later into September, uh, Venus is going to be heading out into the further in the southwest. Uh, we are going to have a cool little conjunction between a very nice crescent moon and Venus. Uh, that's going to be on the 9th. So uh, that puts us late in next week. Um, so that would be the 9th that we're looking at. So uh, go ahead and make sure to check that out. That is the planet Venus uh, right there. So perfect stuff uh, to take a look at. So moving forward. Uh, let's go on to the next planet, Jupiter. Everyone loves Jupiter. Uh, so many people love observing this planet. It's easy to see. Almost any telescope is going to show you a nice image of it. The Galilean moons are a fun one to see. This is naked eye visible right after the sun goes down. You'll see it bright and shining 
rising in the southeast um so that's a good one to go check out uh you know jupiter is a a fun planet if you've if this is your first year owning a telescope then this is really a fun thing to take a look at because you can watch it every night it's going to be different every night the moons are going to be in a different position you can watch the red spot move around um it's just a fun object to observe you know if you've got some kids or you're looking to do some kind of project you can go out each night and like sketch the positions of the moon and watch how they uh move um, it's a very, uh, because of how fast Jupiter rotates, about 10 hours for one rotation, um, you can get a lot of movement even through a short evening of observing, especially if you have something of reference like the red spot. Uh, you can see the red spot on the disk and come back about an hour or two later and it will have moved. So it's noticeable to see the movement in Jupiter. If you're into planetary imaging, you could even do like a time lapse or something like that. So, you know, not a bad thing to take a look at. Uh, so, like I said, Jupiter is actually visible uh, right in, I'm just going to keep it on the 9th. It doesn't really make much of a difference. It's going to be sitting out here in the southwest, literally after sunset. It's high enough to put a telescope on. So, there's Jupiter right there. Uh, easy object to uh, pick out. So, definitely go ahead and check that out. It's well worth observing Jupiter and its uh, moons. So, great, great planet to observe. Um you can get some nice images or nice views of Jupiter in, you know, something as small as a 60 or 70 millimeter refractor. You can see the moons in a small pair of binoculars. Uh, to get a nice view, really detailed view, I would say probably about a four inch telescope is where I would start with. Uh, you want to make sure you're at least 100 power to give you enough image scale to blow the planet up uh, large enough. And then, of course, if you have larger telescopes with more aperture, you have more resolving power, you can run that high, high power stuff a lot better there. So definitely worth it uh, to get out and start observing Jupiter uh, right now. It is the season. Now, it's further out than Jupiter. It's the next one in line, but it's actually rising before Jupiter. That is the planet Saturn. It's also naked eye visible, but it's not... Uh, nearly as bright as Jupiter, so it might look like a fainter star. Um, it is well placed right after sunset. Right after the sun goes down, uh, Saturn is plenty high enough to get a telescope on it um, and really put some magnification on it as long as your telescope is acclimated. Now, like I said, Saturn is just before Jupiter in its position there, so it's, it's definitely something we uh, want to take a look at um, right now. I highly recommend Saturn. Saturn and the moon, whenever you're doing events, um, it's, you know, Saturn is the way to go uh, for the most part. Sorry about that. Um, I know we're, we're still kind of dealing with some technical issues and I'm not sure why. So I apologize for all that. We're gonna have to take a close look at why this is being so problematic. Um, lately it used to be real smooth and nice and now it's not playing nice so I apologize for all the the jumpy freezing and all of that so um, just bear with us we're gonna try to make this better moving forward uh, but hopefully the audio is okay and we'll do what we can to to get through this one and see why this is being such a major pain for us lately Maybe we'll just have to go to a podcast where there's no, you know, me floating around. Let us know what you think about that in the comments. Yeah, I'm going to YouTube that. So, um, now the sun. The sun right now is actually kicking back up. If The sun's actually a very cool object to observe. If you've never done it before, uh, let me go to this. Um, this is what I use. This is called Gong. Um, National Solar Observatory. You can just type in G O N G H Alpha um, in Google or Yahoo and whatever your preferred search engine is. This updates frequently. Um, it's a good way to see what's going on in the sun in hydrogen alpha. Now there have been some sunspots up on the sun, but it's it's definitely one of those things where we need to uh, keep an eye on what's going on with the sun to make sure it's worth lugging out 
um, pulling out a bunch of stuff. So this is what I actually use for if I'm if I need to see what I'm going to be uh, doing with stuff. So um, with white light filters, and we've done episodes about solar filters and observing the sun. So if you need to know more about that, go ahead and go back and check out those episodes. But white light filters are good for observing sunspots. And there have been some sunspots recently as the sun uh, moves into maximum over the next couple of years. Uh, but the most dynamic way to observe the sun is in hydrogen alpha. You know, something like, a, you know, Daystar, Coronado, Lunt, Solar, um, Solar Spectrum, all those types of specialty filters there. Hydrogen alpha is really the way to go if you want to observe the sun. I know it's more expensive, but it's far more dynamic of a wavelength to see all those details. So if you're looking to observe the sun and you want to see what's going on, maybe you don't have time to pop everything out or it's not all set up, but you just want to see if it's worth it, go to this website, uh, check it out. It shows you the latest and greatest uh, from some professional telescopes from all around the world. And you'll be able to see if it's worth lugging that whole thing out. Uh, but this is what I use. This is what I recommend. The sun is an excellent target to observe because it changes frequently day to day. It's always different. Uh, and I have some friends who do some sketching of it. Uh, obviously, astrophotography with high speed cameras is an option. But the sun is just its own thing. Um, and you really have to approach it as its own its own thing, too. It's very different from deep sky observing. Um Obviously, you do not need a massive amount of aperture uh, to observe it. Um, more aperture does help, but usually about 100 millimeter and smaller is what you want for daytime seeing. It's also the only version of astronomy that's carcinogen, so wear your sunscreen. Uh, but uh, solar astronomy is very dynamic. It's always changing. I uh, highly recommend it if you're uh, looking for something to do, especially if you don't like staying up late. So that is some solar observing stuff. Uh, this is what's going up on the sun. You can always check it. These are constantly updating. Um, so hopefully that is, you know, here's just some basic stuff that we, you know, talk about. There's sunspots. Um, but it's a worthy object to observe. If you don't have the equipment to do it, I recommend looking into it. It's just a way to expand your hobbies, capabilities. You know, there's so much to do on the sun. It's, it's definitely worth uh, adding some piece of equipment to observe it if you have the interest to. Meteor showers. Now, August was kind of the premier meteor shower of the year with the Perseid meteor showers. Uh, that's usually the largest one of the year. So everyone looks forward to that one because of just how many you can actually see uh, with it. And, you know, the after that, we kind of go into a lull. There's nothing until late October uh, for meteor showers right now. Um, you'll probably luck out. You'll probably get some uh, shooting stars if you're looking in the right place. And if you're in a dark sky, you'll probably get a fair amount of them as well. But there's no major meteor showers this month. We'll wait till next month and we'll talk about the upcoming ones, which I believe is the Orionids, um, which is also a good one. But we'll talk more detail on that in next month's What's Up in the Night Sky uh, episode. So keep up with that. Comets. Now, those of you who have watched before, I, I can't put comets up on the the talk, or not the talk, I'm sorry, but the presentation because they change all the time. So rather than doing all that, I'm going to get rid of this. This is the website I like to use. This is called cometchasing.skyhound.com. Um, it has all the major comets that are visible right now with all the details that you could possibly want. Um, that's really no reason to recite everything on here because uh, there's just so much but if you're looking for comets if you're interested in comets and you want to know what to observe um this is the one to do it cometchasing.skyhound.com so every major comet that's you know interesting to observe at the moment this is going to give you details about it and then as we scroll down it kind of organizes it between northern and southern hemisphere Southern Hemisphere tends to luck out and get all the good ones for the most part. But, you know, we could still get some stuff up here. Um, it looks like the brightest one right now would be C2019L3 Atlas. Uh, right now, that's an Auriga. And it says that's about 10th magnitude, which you're talking to probably about a 4-inch telescope. 
it's probably fairly small and condensed at the moment. But uh, what's nice about this website is you can actually get star charts for it. So it'll show you where you need to look and you know you can actually try to get your telescope on the position there some you know apps like sky safari are very good at keeping some of their databases up to date so if you have a go-to telescope and you don't know exactly where the comet is uh, try looking up some some of the details in your apps because they tend to keep them updated with uh, more of the modern comets as well but um yeah it's it's hanging out near links and stuff like that at the moment here's a uh, over the next month or so, there's its path right there. But that's the nice thing about all the details on this website is it gives you all this information so you can go out and try to find it. Um, a lot of these comments right now, let's close this one out. Um, I don't see anything that's majorly exciting at the moment. But with comments, the one thing you want to pay attention to is that is always subject to change. Uh, Comets are wild cards of the astronomy world. So just because one is kind of like, eh, right now, in a couple weeks, it, it, something could happen and could be, you know, an amazing comet. Like we did, we had last year with Hamstar. Star, I don't know. I can't remember. Um, but you never know. So keeping an eye on this page, uh, if you're into comets, is a well-worthy thing to uh, take a look at, especially if you're in observing that or you want to try imaging some of them so uh, take a look at that uh, again cometchasing.skyhound.com that'll give you all the information on the best comets to observe right now um, so hopefully that uh, works well for everybody but definitely worth um, taking a look at if you're in the southern hemisphere too maybe you're watching from um, australia or new zealand um, or you know anywhere in the southern hemisphere um, there are there's listings in here too. There we go. We got some Southern Hemisphere stuff um, to take a look at as well. So keep an eye out for all of that. It's it's always changing. Comets are a lot of fun to observe, and you never know when you're going to get a really good one that starts popping up. So that is the website I use. Highly recommend it. It uh, gives you all the information you'll ever want to know about all the latest and greatest comets. Deep Sky. Now... It's September. We're technically still in summer until the 20, 21st or so um, when we finally get into autumn. So now is the last hurrah to get the uh, deep sky targets for the summer. Um, a lot of the stuff sitting in the southern part of the sky. Uh, let me pull this up. Get this a little bit later. So right now, oh, we don't need to know about Saturn anymore. Right now, all the big popular stuff, of course, that a lot of us like to look at is in Scorpio, Sagittarius, Ophiuchus, um, of course, making our way up to uh, Cygnus, the swan, I'm sorry. But all that major stuff sits along the summer Milky Way. And stuff like the Lagoon and the Trifid and M16, the Eagle, M17, the swan, all of that is still visible right now, but it's going to start setting. Um, We've actually, a lot of this stuff by about 8 o'clock has already moved past uh, the meridian. And if you're not sure what the meridian is, I don't know if this one does it accurate. I'll have to mess with this a little bit more. But the meridian is this, you know, made up line that splits the sky um, from the east and the west. And basically, that's the highest point that that object will get. So an object is rising in the east all the way till it gets to the meridian, like the halfway point in the sky. And then once it passes that, it's setting in the west. And that's how it works. So as you can see right here, let me turn off grids. That'll work. So this one right here, almost due south, is the meridian line. I wish there might, there's probably a way in Stellarium to make that pop out more. But I don't know how to do it. So, uh, the meridian's the halfway point. As you can see, about 8 o'clock, and you want to see when it's actually dark, dark, where you're at. Um, astronomical twilight is the official term for that. Um, usually in California right now, I believe that's about 9 o'clock. It is moving forward, so the nights are getting longer. Um, 
But most of those cool things that we want to see are past the meridian after sunset, which means if you want to get out and image something, uh, you need to be on it right as it gets dark because you've only got a couple hours before that sets. Um, most of the stuff in Scorpio is about done. You've got about an hour or so to really get on that. Uh, but, but you still have plenty of time to get out there and do some viewing. Obviously, viewing doesn't take as much time as astrophotography does. But if you're looking to get that shot of the lagoon or the trifid, I would probably say this weekend would be the major time to do that. You still have enough time to get a nice image of all those uh, summertime jewels in the core of the Milky Way that's kind of sitting out here. But ultimately, you really want to make sure that you know, you're on that because come this time in October, a lot of that's going to be getting very low in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, I'm sorry, Southern Horizon. And it's it's about done. So we're almost done with the summer season and we're going to start getting into autumn um, with a lot of cool things. There's already a ton of stuff up right now. That's what we're going to talk about. So like I said um, earlier, it's still a good time to get out and do some Milky Way stuff. Uh, Milky Way is primely set um, right after the sun goes down. Um, it's almost straight up um, from the south, so definitely worth getting out and doing some nightscape pictures. Uh, this would probably be, well, you could probably get away with it until October, but it's going to be further over um, setting. Depends on the angle that you want, but now would be the best time to get out and start going with that um, for the summer Milky Way. Now, one of the coolest targets that's up right now is up in Cygnus. It's called the Crescent Nebula, NGC 6888. It's about 5,000 light years away. Uh, this is a very interesting nebula. There's a lot going on with it, both visually and uh, scientifically. It's known as a wolf Riot star, um, which is a star that's kind of giving off um, stellar wind, and that's... Um, that's interacting with other wind that's in the area. Um, there's You can look it up. It's called Wolf, Wolf Riot Stars. Um, check them out. They're actually pretty interesting. But that's what's causing this nebula right here is this outgassing that's uh, essentially being affected by the stellar winds um, in this area. So it's a very interesting type of object. Um, you've probably seen this thing a hundred times on you know Astro Bin and stuff like that. But that's because it's a very cool object to image. Now, visually... Um, and this is kind of new uh, for those of you who have joined us before. I'm breaking up my slides now to where we talk visual specs and imaging specs because I like to do both. And I know many of you out there, some of you just do visual, some of you just do imaging. So I'm trying to keep the, the little notes there separate so you can get that information and apply it more towards what you're trying to do. Um, it's a bit of a challenge of a target to see visually. Uh, you don't get all the major structure that you can see, obviously, in an image. I would recommend dark skies. Uh, ultimately, uh, probably about a 10-inch or bigger. The more aperture you can throw on it, the better. It sits very high up in the sky, so right now it's in a very good position. It's almost at zenith, so it's a very good uh, time to observe it. Um, UHC and O3 filters can help bring out some of the other detail there. So if you're looking for some filters to assist with it, um, that helps pop that out. Uh, usually what you can see in the telescope is just kind of the brighter outer edges uh, that you can see right here. Uh, so you can get some of it. You might get some of the molting effect, the brain looking effect um, inside there. With a larger telescope, it would be interesting to see if you ever have a chance to get like a 20 inch or something on there. It would be interesting to see what you can get out of there. Um, I haven't looked at it in a while. Last time I really looked at it was with a C14 from Celestron. It was an impressive view. It did very nice. Um, so some major aperture on there is always your friend. Now, for my astrophotographers, this object is very eclectic when it comes to trying to image it it looks great in visible light it looks great in narrow band it sits in a very complex uh, field up in the middle of cygnus there's a lot of uh, hydrogen in the region this is a bicolor image right here so it's a mix of hydrogen alpha and o3 um, it looks good in a wide variety of optics i've seen really interesting stuff at 135 millimeters if you want to get it in the major area around it 
like I said, it's an entire nebulous field. Um, and of course, if you just want to shoot the Crescent on its own, I'd probably recommend focal lengths of about 600 millimeters or longer just to give you some image scale. Like I said, it looks good in visible light or narrow band. So if you're at home and you can't get away to a dark sky site, narrow band filters, you know, H alpha O3, those are your friends. It's very, uh, there's a lot going on in there and I've actually posted, here's the, this is my image from last year, but here's the hydrogen data of that shot. You can see the background is filled with all these very light uh, wisps of hydrogen in the field. It's a very dense region. There's a lot going on in there. So even a black and white image in hydrogen alpha looks phenomenal. Now, it's interesting because there's also some detail in there. Um, there's an outer shell of the crescent that's very active in oxygen three. So uh, let me switch this out, uh, blink between the two. So this is O3. There's hydrogen, O3, hydrogen. Um, but you can see that outer envelope shell right there really starts to come out in oxygen three. So if you're trying to get that, O3 is your friend there. Uh, there's the outer shell I'm referring to right there. That is extremely, if not absolutely impossible to see visually unless you've got some decked out super large telescope, maybe even with an image intensifier strapped to it. Um, that outer shell would be rather difficult to see visually. Um, I would put that up there as an extreme challenge um, possibly impossible with the naked eye without some crazy crazy stuff to do it prove me wrong go do it um, but that's the outer shell easy to see um in astrophotography images though especially if you're using an o3 filter now several years ago i think it was 2007 ish there's a little companion not far from the crescent nebula um it's called the soap bubble now the soap bubble is a almost perfectly spherical planetary nebula um, that was discovered by David Drasfitch, a very well-known astrophotographer. Um, and yeah, he, he found this just sitting out in the field. And this is just, I think we'll see a lot more of something like this as cameras have gotten so much better. Um, you're going to be able to see all these little faint details and things that maybe in the past we haven't been able to see because cameras have gotten very good nowadays, very sensitive cameras. So you're, what you're able to pull out in shorter amounts of time is pretty interesting. Now this wide field image you see here, this is also in hydrogen. Uh, the soap bubble being a planetary nebula means it's very active in oxygen three. So it would look a lot better if I had shot this in O3, but I, I haven't gotten the data for that yet. So um, if you wanna get the crescent and the soap bubble and you're doing like a bicolor or a narrow band image, O3 is really going to pop that little thing out. Um, it's very faint there. I don't know if you can quite see the, the bubble there. Um, here's a hyperstar, C14 hyperstar shot. Um, you can kind of see that, that soap bubble in the middle there. Um, but it is very faint, a very difficult object. I have heard of people observing this with massive Dobsonians, you know, 36 inch and larger Dobsonians. So you need a big, big, big telescope to see the bubble nebula. It's a challenge for imaging. Um, you're gonna need some serious O3 time to pull this thing out, but it's kind of a cool companion that's next door to the Crescent if you're gonna be shooting a wide enough field or framing it in a certain way. So that's the Crescent Nebula NGC 6888, and it's a little companion, the bubble, uh, the soap bubble nebula. Kind of a cool field. Uh, the next one, I see 5146, the cocoon. This is also in Cygnus. It's actually off the tail. It's not far from the North American nebula. Um, this one is actually a, uh, fairly easy to see with the right conditions in a dark sky site. Uh, it's about 2,500 light years away. Uh, you will need about a 10 inch telescope and an H beta filter would be a very helpful filter to pull out the crescent. The crescent's this portion down here, actually a little uh, light nodule down here. Um, imaging, it looks great in a bunch of different focal lengths. This is a 200 millimeter Canon F 2.8 L lens with a full frame, I believe on the back of it, monochrome full frame and hydrogen alpha. Um, 
there's a very dense star field in this area, and there's also some dark nebula that are associated with the Cocoon Nebula. Um, those dark nebulas would be very difficult to see visually, but the Cocoon is possible, especially with some larger aperture, um, and an H-beta filter can help with it. Uh, imaging, like I said, wide variety of targets, uh, wide variety of focal lengths make it look interesting. Obviously, this is 200 millimeters, so you can get that uh, those dust clouds that come off of the Cocoon. Or you can get a long focal length system and zoom in just on the cocoon. So there's a couple different ways you can approach it. It does look good in visual light or narrow band. It just depends on what your style is and where you're shooting from. Um, so again, here's the cocoon. The cocoon is IC5148 hanging down at the bottom of the frame. And then the dust regions coming off of there this is what's known as Barnard 168. Um, those of you who know me know I'm a big fan of dark nebulas. Uh, we have a, several we're talking about today, actually. And Barnard, or the Barnard Catalog, is a list of dark nebulas. And a lot of them are found in the Milky Way arms. And this is the 168th entry of that. You know, So that's hanging just off of the Crescent Nebula up there. Very Probably a very difficult object to see uh, visually. But the cameras obviously can assist with that. This was shot in my backyard. Uh, again, using a hydrogen alpha filter. And just letting the telescope or letting the optical system and the camera do its thing. But yeah, if you've got a narrow band set, like a H alpha filter, you can do a lot of cool stuff from home. So give it a shot. So that is the Crescent Nebula. I'm sorry, that is the Cocoon Nebula. Now, the North American Nebula, NGC 7000. Uh, this is a big, big target. Uh, this was actually shot with our Evo Guide 50, this particular image, with its little field flattener and I think a ZW0294 or something like that. I don't remember. I'd have to look up the specs. That's 2,600 light years away. This is a massive hydrogen region. Um, so it's a star forming region. The dust is condensing down. Uh, the reason it's red is because a lot of hydrogen in it. Uh, it's very easy to see in a dark sky site with like a three inch telescope, but you will need a UHC or O3 filter to help pop it out of the background. Larger telescopes because of how big this thing actually is in the, in the field. It's like three degrees of the night sky. It's a big chunk of the sky. So with larger telescopes, you'll be able to pull out a lot more detail, especially down here in like the, what would be the Mexico Gulf region. Um, this is called the the wall right here, this, you know, really rigid area. Um, this is actually very easy to see in large telescopes. It's actually very impressive. There's a lot of detail in there. So if you have like a 8-inch daub or bigger, pop an O3 filter on there and kind of cruise around that area. It's very cool to see uh, all the stuff that's in that area of the sky. Definitely worth uh, checking out. Imaging-wise, it's fantastic in almost any focal length because if you want to get the whole North American like what you're seeing here this is like 240 millimeters uh with like an APS-C size sensor so if you're into you know if you got like a star tracker on like a 7200 here's a target for you this would work really well um if you got longer focal length maybe you want to zoom in in just some particular areas of that uh nebula like we said around the gulf and the Mexico area in there very good spot to to do stuff so even though it's a very large portion of the night sky don't be afraid to try different focal lengths on it um it does very good in visual light uh, like one shot color cameras and it's very dynamic and narrow band so if you wanted to do um like a hubble palette image i've seen some very cool stuff off of that as well so there's all kinds of cool things to do. But the North American Nebula, it sits high in the sky right now. So you still have several hours to where you could hit it if you're doing astrophotography. But that's a very good object. Very Because it's so large, it's very forgiven. Um, so, you know, star trackers and such would be a good option for this. Uh, Tom, this was taken with a CMOS camera on the back of the Evo Guide 50 with its field flat. Uh, here's a larger shot of that as well. So 
uh actually uh this is a good question uh hugo in the chat's asking what about suburban skies this was taken from my backyard um i live in the middle of phoenix so it is not a dark sky at all um so this was taken with i believe a zw0294 uh one shot color and then i used one of the uh l enhance filters those multi-band narrow band filters um which are great to do with suburban sky imaging if you want to get that narrow band effect with a one shot color camera uh, that's what that combo was so a couple hours worked really well so give that a shot now we're getting into autumn and one of the big big staples of autumn is m31 the andromeda galaxy um, obviously it's in the constellation of andromeda if you didn't figure that one out kind of obvious um this is the furthest thing you can see with your naked eye from a dark sky site, two and a half million light years away. You can see this naked eye in a dark sky location. It looks awesome. Um, a pair of small binoculars in a dark sky with this thing is amazing. I actually prefer to look at it in binoculars than a big telescope because you can really get the, really emphasizes how big of a space this galaxy takes up it's impressive to see just how big it is um it looks great in a pair of like 50 millimeter binoculars from a dark sky location so give it a shot if you're going out this weekend um it can be done in town you can still get some nice views in town you're not going to get the the fainter extensions of the outer arms of the galaxy like you could see um but you, you you'd still see the glowing core and you'd see it's some of its companions. So you have M32 over here and M110 over here. M110 is a little bit more diffuse and fainter. So it's going to be harder to see, especially if you're in town. Um, any size telescope, it does a nice job on. The dark spiral arm dust bands in here are also visible in telescopes. Um, I wasn't able to see them until I had my 16 inch daub, but in the right conditions you can definitely see them and you can really get the overall structure of it with a you know six inch plus telescope now for imaging again wide range of optics will work you know if you've got a 135 millimeter telephoto perfect you got a z you got a red cat perfect you've got you know whatever this particular image right here was taken with an esprit 150 uh, six inch refractor at f7 so 1050 millimeter but it's a full frame camera so it just squeezes the majority onto the frame there um so even at a thousand millimeters it's uh pretty good to go with it um it works very actually the only real way to do this is with you know color so visible light rgb or one shot color cameras or dslrs that's the way to go if you have monochrome capability, maybe add a little bit of H-alpha data. It'll help pop the star forming regions out a little bit and kind of add some dynamics um, to your shot a little bit. So just a FYI on that. And again, here's a higher resolution image of that. Um, this was taken again with an Esprit 150 and a ZWO 6200 uh, camera. Uh, so that's really get the scale in there. Now, going off of a little bit more exotic at this point, uh, this is Barnard 150. So earlier we talked about the Crescent Nebula with Barnard 168. This is another one in the catalog called Barnard 150. The Seahorse Nebula, it's in Cepheus, 1,200 light years away. Visually, this would be a challenge. I would, you were going to need some aperture on this one, um, and you're going to have to take your time to see if you can actually see it i would also recommend once you're on the target grabbing the telescope and slowly moving it side to side to see if you can see it you're basically looking for the absence of stars because it's a dark nebula obstructing background stars so definitely take a look try it out uh dark nebulas i find need not just dark skies but very transparent skies so you might be in a location that's dark but you need good transparency as well. So high altitude uh, locations would probably help. You know, you could try with a four inch telescope, but the more aperture you have, the more it'll help to really pop that detail out and horse uh, nebula. Imaging, dark nebulas have no substitute for 
dark skies you pretty much need dark skies to do this uh, they are not a narrow band target because you're basically looking for the absence of stars you could probably do hydrogen alpha with this in town but you're basically going to shoot the star field and you're going to look for the clumps that don't have stars but if you want a true detailed image of it you really need a a good clean visible light image uh, a good luminance set uh, would be helpful this particular one was eight hours of exposure with four hours of luminance so it really helps pop out all that subtle detail in there um, also when you're processing these be very careful a lot of people like to clip the blacks of their image you know they'll they'll find the black point and they'll run the slider all the way there and just to make the background as black as possible but when you're shooting nebulas like this, you can see that there's actually a lot of background nebulosity that's very delicate. And if you move everything to the black, you will get rid of all of that. And that's what you're shooting those deep images for is trying to get all that out of there. So uh, here's a larger image of the, the seahorse there. Uh, very cool region. You can see all the dust in there. Again, it's very delicate. So... If you're going to be imaging and processing stuff like this, the only true black background here is right in here where there's no dust. Everywhere else is dust. So careful when you're processing images like this because you could easily get rid of a lot of the faint stuff that you want to see. Uh, another cool one that's up right now, NGC 7635, the bubble. Cassiopeia, about 11,000 light years away. I have seen this in a telescope before. It's very small. So you're going to want some, definitely want some aperture, probably want some uh, UHC or Oxygen 3 filters to bust that out a little bit further, um, and probably about a 12-inch telescope, and very much take your time. You're not going to see all this extra stuff floating around there. You're looking for just the bubble. Um, let me just fast forward this real quick. Um, when you're observing this visually, you're looking for basically this arc and this bright star and the little detail, the brightest portions of the bubble are basically what you're going to see. All this other stuff, my, maybe with the exception of these bright areas right here, you're not going to have a lot of visibility to. Unless you've got some serious telescope on it. Um, but all this other stuff is very, very faint. So if you want to see this stuff, it's really more of a imaging thing. Uh, this is also a very dynamic region for narrow band images. So if you are at home and you can't get to dark skies, excellent target uh, for uh, narrow band. Let me blow through this real quick. Um, I put a lot of targets. Um, this is another one, NGC 654 with LDN 1334. This was shot last night. This is fresh off the scope from this morning. Um, eight hours of exposure time using two telescopes, one shooting luminance, one shooting color and applying all that. That's generally how I like to do things. This goes faster. This is in Cassiopeia. NGC 654 is this little cluster right here in the middle and LDN 30, 1334 is the dark nebula. I like to call it the, um, the dark dragon nebula because it looks like that. Um, cluster is very easy to see, very dynamic region with a lot of stars. Um, but if you want to get the LDN nebula there, you're going to need some dark skies, good luminance, or at least a, a fair amount of time on your color camera, probably at least a couple hours to pop this out. But a very cool region of the sky up in Cassiopeia with a lot going on. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Again, that's uh, NGC 654, which is the cluster right here. Probably pretty easy to get from in town. Um, but if you want that dark nebula, what I call the dark dragon, um, is uh or the black dragon that's what i call it black dragon nebula here's the head here's the smoke uh neck goes down here and yeah so the black dragon nebula is what i call it um that's ldn 1334 bit of a challenge object right next to an easy target so the cluster easy to see in a small telescope imaging this is really a visible color camera target no narrow band here and there's a bigger shot of that right there. This is the open cluster. And this is the Black Dragon Nebula right there. And LDN 1334. All right. Now, next month is Halloween. Crazy enough. Uh, 
This is in Cepheus. Cepheus right now is rising up into the sky. This is a very interesting constellation if you're looking for really odd, off the beaten path, really strange nebulas. Uh, look up Cepheus and all the stuff that it's got in here. This is the Ghost Nebula, 1470, uh, 1470 light years away. This would be a, quite a challenge to see visually. You will need dark skies. No filters will help you here. You just have to have sheer dark skies and very careful observation uh, of this area. Um, for imaging, again, dark skies, color cameras, visible light, narrow band is not going to do anything for these kinds of dark, you know, molecular cloud nebulas. This is just sheer dark skies. So this is a fun one. It's not far from the Iris Nebula. So if you're looking for something to do, maybe you're going out for a couple nights this weekend, give this one a go. It's about eight hours of exposure right here as well, about four hours in luminance, four hours in color. Uh, but that is the Ghost Nebula um, up there in Cepheus. Not right next door to the Iris, actually. So it's not far from there. Now, last one on the list, the fun one up in Pegasus, NGC 7331 and Stefan's Quintet, uh, 290 light years away. These are galaxies, so you're going to want some focal length on it to give you some image scale. I would recommend probably about 800 millimeters or longer or, you know, high resolution on your sensor to match up with that. Uh, visible and about a 12 inch telescope. But Stefan's Quintet, which is the galaxy cluster, biggest telescope you can find, the more interesting it gets. Um, let me blow this up real quick. Here's the full thing here, but we're going to label this real quick. So there's NGC 7331. This is the Deerlick Galaxy. I don't know why they call it that, honestly, but I'm sure there's a reason. There's a ton of little galaxies in this region because it's the Deerlick group. And then, of course, up at the upper right, we have Stefan's Quintet, which is a galaxy cluster. If you have a big DOB or access to a big telescope and you like galaxy clusters, this is probably one of the first ones you're going to want to dig into because it's easiest. Um, it is the easiest uh, galaxy cluster to really dive into in comparison to some of the other uh, dense ones like the Abels and stuff, crazy stuff like that. Now, here's an up-close shot blowing up this image. There's a lot of galaxies in here. So here's all the labels right here. Now, I would get a detailed map if you want to go out and check these out. Um, there's a lot of detail and a lot of little stuff packed into this galaxy cluster, but I've observed it in an 18-inch telescope. It looked very nice. Uh, more aperture, darker skies, the better. Um, if you're trying to image this, I'd probably say about an 800 millimeter focal length. This was taken on our Esprit 150, which is 1.4 arc seconds per pixel with our 6200 bin two by two. So it matches up really well to give us the sharp scene conditions. Um, but longer focal length will give you more image scale on something like that. So that is Stefan's Quintet up in Pegasus, fantastic galaxy uh, set of galaxies up there. So definitely try that out. That's pretty much it for this week uh thanks for joining us if you liked what you see here subscribe and like the videos we definitely appreciate it uh, if you have any questions go ahead and email us at info at skywatcherusa.com you can title it what's up so we know what you're talking about and next week we're talking gear again we're talking about the eq8r series we're going to dig into all the the nitty gritties of those big big mounts so we hope you have you Come join us next week. We'll talk about those. If you're interested in learning about the EQA Rs, um, we'll be talking about both the R and the RH models. So talking about our flagship mount. So join us next week for that at 10 a.m. right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. That pretty much wraps up this week's episode. Thank you very much for hanging out with us. Thanks for putting up with all of our weird tech issues that we've had lately. We're going to get that fixed to make this as smooth as possible. Uh, but again, thanks for joining us on your Friday morning. Have a safe weekend. Clear skies. And uh, yeah, if you've got images, share them with us. Tag it. Tag us in our social media. We'd love to see what you guys pull out uh, if you're doing some imaging. Or if you've just got your equipment out in the field and you want to show it off, tag it at Skywatcher uh, USA on Instagram. And 
you know, on Facebook. So thanks very much, everyone. Have a safe weekend, clear skies, and we will see you next Friday. Take care, everyone.